the great are not great. The great only appear great because we are on our knees. Let us arise! And they formed up in their military order outside Liberty Hall and they got the order to quick march. GPO and then faced to the left and told charge A nation once again A nation once again And Ireland won a province team A nation once again to a freedom of and service high and holy. The people feign my feelings bad, a passion vain or lowly. The freedom comes from God's right hand and needs a godly train. And righteous men will make our land a nation once again. against the forebears who had missed the opportunities down through the years to rebel and rise up in arms. And he put it this way, the United Irishmen waited too long, he said. The Young Islanders, they waited too long. And the Fenians, the Fenians, they waited too long. In everything, somebody must move first or take the lead. To us, he said, the great opportunity has come. This was his article. And then he posed the question, have we been wise? The future alone will tell. I thought it was only around 19... 1914 that he began to realise that there would have to be a conflict. After the lockout period then? Um, it would be after the lockout, hmm. I would think. You know. hmm. And there I would disagree with you, John, my All dear right. brother. I would disagree with you there. I think um, my grandfather's mind was clearly and steadily focused on military action long before 1916 came about. He was a great admirer and read a lot and studied what was happening in South Africa. And he studied the leaders and he knew all about them and he did different campaigns. He was quite au fait with it. An interesting, uh, quite a number of his poems that were discovered in 1906 uh, were about the leaders of the Boer War and about the campaign. And I think that that was the, the episode in history that convinced him this was right. A small country like the Boers and that, to rise up and confront the enemy, the British, in arms and fight. 
As he left Liberty Hall, Bill O'Brien asked Connolly, Is there any hope? Connolly replied, None whatsoever. We're going out to be slaughtered. And I think that his feelings and his model of the ICA and what they were going to do was based all on that. And that was 10, 12 years earlier. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, James Connolly as a military strategist? I would think from even some of his writings, I get the impression that planning was the important thing. At the same time, he was fearful that to spend too much time on the nitty gritty of detail and planning this and if this and what if this happens what will we do and so on that he would get lost in what was the the centre and the object of the rebellion. In 1915 the dock workers went on strike. Connolly wryly remarked a large section has been formed for drill and every day the men are instructed on military exercises. We are thus rapidly becoming the best drilled body of men in Ireland. For a time it was difficult to get our men trained, as dock work keeps men employed always in the evenings. But the employers are kindly helping us to get over that difficulty. The things were very exciting in Liberty Hall, which was the, the main headquarters and planning centre of uh, how the rebellion would be launched. There was a lot of thought and excitement and tension in Liberty Hall in, the, in those days. During the summer of 1915, Connolly researched and published military essays from 1905 Moscow insurrection to the defence of the Alamo. At this time, the ICA activity was being watched by detectives and police. The ICA would go on a route march and stay out until the early hours just to antagonise those sent to spy on them. Detectives report on 24th October 1915. At 12.15am, 120 persons marched to Christchurch Place. They remained in the locality till 3am. They took part in a dance in Inchicore. They marched back to College Green at 5.20 a.m. and were dismissed at 6 a.m. Each man brought his rifle home. Connolly didn't need policemen searching the Transport Union building. He was afraid they would seize the printing press. The place was also an arsenal. They had made grenades, bullets and bombs. Hundreds of live bullets were stored up a chimney. A fire was lit but quickly extinguished. Connolly moved his bed into Liberty Hall. His followers had a full bodyguard on him. They feared the British Army would arrest, deport or assassinate him. At the end of June 1915, the unrepentant Fenian, Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, exiled in America since 1871, passed away at the age of 83. Tom Clark sent a telegram to John Devoy. Send his body home at once. Clark and Connolly, according to his wife Kathleen Clark, became great friends and kept friends to the end. Connolly was a member of the Guards and Procession Subcommittee. The Guard of Ross's remains was the ICA and the Volunteers. They jointly formed the Guard of Honour at his funeral. And somebody at the tail end of the company wheeling a cart with carrying the ammunition, an ordinary wheel cart, mm. and extra rifles. They chose the GPO, the communications heart of the country and the centre of Dublin city, as the building on which to hoist the flag of an Irish Republic. Initially, in, in the first couple of days, a lot of time spent organising where they would place men and troops and what places had been taken over and how they were fixed for ammunition etc and that and who else was coming in to join the fight 
where were the volunteers? Were they coming in? And what was happening down the country? They didn't know. They didn't know. Very difficult. They had no really intelligence service. That was the one thing that they lacked, which the British, of course, had. One of the early moves planned by the volunteers was to disrupt communication by cutting telephone and telegraph links, thereby delaying the British ability to request assistance in Dublin and for reinforcements to be summoned from England. Post office telephone staff, mostly young women, continued to work at their desks in Oldborough House in Crown Alley, Dublin, passing on urgent messages for the British government and army as it tried to put down the rebellion the first person I saw in the portico outside the GPO was James Connolly in uniform with a huge Colt revolver, shouting out orders. Volunteers were battering out window panes. When James Connolly saw me, he called, All priests may pass, as the volunteers were keeping the inquisitive onlookers at some distance. I think that that was a very stressful time for both James and the other leaders. Uh, and what was worst of all was the betrayal and I used that word uh, very carefully but to me it was betrayal on an enormous scale a military leader's worst nightmare to have orders countermanded and everything f to fall into confusion and disarray and I think that must have nearly broken James's heart and the other leaders too that that happened and that was unforgivable. A small measure of comfort that James might have derived from the whole thing was the fact that his Two daughters, Nora and Ina, were not there. They were up in Cold Island, was it? Up in the north, yes. Up in the north, yes. trying to get everyone to up and march down. And Yes, their mission, in fact, was to try and countermand the, the, the countermanding the order. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an aspect that has been kind of glossed over very often of the years gone by and that and it has never been studied and examined and scrutinised and taken apart bit by bit as to why it happened. How were Nora and Roddy involved in 1916? Or well, Roddy was uh, brought along by his father, James, and he, as far as I understand it, was called a staff lieutenant. Nowadays they call him personal aid. 
my father, our father, said to his father, he'd been looking around at Pierce and McDonough and Dermot and Plunkett and Kelt and all. He was quite surprised by Plunkett. And he said to his father, he said, why have we got that man? He's a very sickly. He doesn't appear to be capable to be involved in something as serious as this. And the father said, that man, he said, has more courage in his little finger than all the rest of them put together. Why didn't uh, James keep Ina and Nora down with him as well and send some other uh, gentlemen who perhaps would be more forceful in beating the other forces well, down I, the road? I think that's mm. easily answered that Nora and Ina were the ones that were used to Belfast. They had worked in That's Belfast, right. they had lived mm -hmm. in Belfast. They knew where these Republican uh, Confederates mm -hmm. would be and, and who were the important men to contact to find out if anything was going to happen in the North. That's why he sent them. Connolly impressed on his only son Roddy, just 15 years old, the necessity to bring a bundle of important papers to Bill O'Brien's home at 7 Belvedere Place and to stay there. That afternoon, Connolly dictated a communique to the officers and soldiers of the Army of the Irish Republic in the other districts. Comrades, we salute you. This day, the flag of the Irish Republic has been hoisted in Dublin, and the armed forces of the Irish Republic have everywhere met the enemy and defeated them. North, south, east and west, the Irish army has been in action all day, and at no single point has it been driven in, nor lost a single position it has taken up. In the name of Ireland, we salute you. This is the greatest day in Irish history, and it is you who have made it so. On Thursday at 1 o'clock, Connolly was wounded in the left arm and 10 minutes later in the left leg, a compound fracture of the shin bone when supervising the erection of a barricade on Prince's Street. Young medical student James Ryan remembers, he asked me to dress it, being Connolly's arm, and when leaving begged me not to tell anybody. Before long he was carried back on a stretcher with a severe wound in the ankle in great pain. According to James Ryan, when Connolly awoke, he asked to be put in a bed with casters so that he could be moved to the front hall. Nothing could conquer the will of this man. Due to the intense fire, the GPO was evacuated and Conley was carried by stretcher to Coggins, a grocer shop on 10 Moore Street. Elizabeth O'Farrell knelt and asked him how he was feeling. Conley replied, Bad. The soldier who wounded me did a good day's work for the British government. It was reported that when James was being carried out of the GPO with the stretcher bearers, that there was a young man assisting uh, the stretcher bearers, and in fact, probably helping to uh, carry. And James is reported to have looked up and said, How old are you, son? And the young boy said, I'm 14, Mr. Connolly. James Ryan recalls, 
On Saturday morning, we moved from house to house through board walls. The openings were small and the stretcher would not pass through. We had to put him in a sheet and so carry him northwards. He must have suffered torture during that journey, but he never complained. The Irish Independent called for the execution of the leaders of the Rising and was especially hard on Connolly. The following appeared in its editorials. 4th of May. No terms of denunciation would be too strong to apply to those responsible for the criminal and insane Rising of last week. 10th of May. If these men are treated with too great leniency, they will take it as an indication of weakness on the part of the government. They may be more truculent than ever, and it is therefore necessary that society should be protected against their activity. Weakness to such men at this stage would be fatal. Let the worst of the ringleaders be singled out and dealt with as they deserve. What happened to James after the surrender? Well, he was taken to Dublin Castle, which was doubling as a first aid post, as far as I recollect. And right. He was uh, minded up in uh, a room which later became known as the James Connolly room. But I think it was in this room too where he was he was actually court martialed as well mm -hmm. before he was brought up to Kilmainham some ungodly hour, three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning to be executed. The court consisted of three members Colonel D. Lapt, President, Lieutenant Colonel A. M. Bent, Second Royal Munster Fusiliers, and Major F. W. Woodworth, DSO, Loyal North Lanx Regiment. Connolly was propped up in bed before a court-martial and sentenced to die by firing squad. Nora and, and Diddy were present before he was taken for execution. That they, had, uh, they were brought there by, uh, in an ambulance, I think, uh, to say their last goodbyes and that. And uh, it was at that stage that the statement he had made to the court martial about his involvement in the rising and why it was done and all the rest of it, he passed it, he slipped it to Nora, mm. from under the bedclothes and that. And uh, that was the occasion where nor remembered in, in uh, 1966 this, uh, the thing that Lily was getting very upset, very emotional and he asked her to please not to try and get a grip of herself that she, he was afraid that she would unman him. The only other thing that I sort of sticks out in my mind is that when he was about to be executed by the firing squad, the capuchin, well, he was a capuchin priest, was he? Capuchin monk. 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 Brother Aloysius. Brother Aloysius uh, asked him would he say a prayer for the men who were about to shoot him and he replied that he would uh, salute all Good men who do their duty. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. I thought that was immensely moving. Did Lily ever say anything? Did she ever talk about it, Daddy? When you were little? Never. No. Never. 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 I mean, she always is the same. Yeah. You never said anything. Ever. 
But uh, that was the way throughout the Republican families all over the country. Yeah. And it was acknowledged in, 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 by Michael D. Higgins on our visit to him up in Arras and Uchtaran. And he said the same about his family mm -hmm. down west. There was no talk. It wasn't discussed. As if it was a taboo subject mm. that you didn't talk about. It was amazing. It was the strange. most monstrous elephant in the room ever. Yes, yeah, quite strange. James would have hoped, and did hope, I'm sure, that as he copied and tried to emulate the rebellion of the Boers against the British and their successes, that 1916 would be taken as a model for others who were downtrodden, exploited, despoiled, not treated fairly or with justice and that. Mm. They would look at 1916 and say, yes, a small group can gather together and they can foster, and it is possible to foster and engender the will and the bravery and the courage to stand up against their tormentors. I think one of the things that really strikes people is that all the signatories knew they were going to their death. There was going to be no military victory. And not only did they know it, I think every man in that detachment that marched up from Liberty Hall to the GPO also probably thought they would not survive the week. We weren't the only ones involved. We weren't the only ones that had an executed hmm. grandparent. All the others suffered in many ways. Their families suffered and that. And there was a feeling that, the, that all of that was going to be forgotten. I think we have gained our freedom after all. We are a sovereign nation. We govern our own affairs and we have our own sovereignty. And James would have hoped that others would follow us, that would learn from us. Well, I'm Joanna. I'm middle daughter. Middle of, daughter. Middle daughter of James. So I'm a great granddaughter of James Connolly. Um, and my grandfather was Roddy Connolly, or Jack Connolly, their father. Lovely story about Nora. Um, she visited us was um, often, and uh, as, as Dad and John said, wouldn't really talk much about 1916. But I do remember she was very keen to bring us to Kilmainham Jail, and we went. But I would have been probably around 12-ish, 10 to 12. And I was fascinated and horrified by this building um, and the prison and what it meant. And then she brought me into a cell and she told me that it was her cell. Um, and years later, it didn't really, and I kind of, with the, she said this with no great passion or emotion. And I went, oh right, okay, so very matter of fact. But it was really years later as an adult, I thought, my goodness. What must have gone through her mind when she, she stood in the cell that she had been incarcerated in and she was able to tell me who she was with and who else were her, the neighbours and, and everybody else. You couldn't read it in her face. As a child, I couldn't see. Surely there must have been some upset or passion or emotion. And I do believe there was. And uh, But it struck me that they buried this. They buried all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love now to go back in time and, and ask Nora, um, how did you feel? You know, tell me about your feelings because it was done. She maybe had related the story so often that they were so matter of fact 
and you couldn't hear how it affected her. And that's what I find fascinating, is when we talk about the Connolly legacy, is really the, the impact, the execution of James had on the family and on um, Roddy, my grandfather. He never spoke about it all his life. He never spoke about it no. to you. He never no. spoke it to my, to my dad. You know, and there was a reserve about him. There was a reserve about Nora. And that, to me, is part of the legacy that did have an impact. Mm -hmm. And when you were growing up as kids, like you at school, we we learned all about the political. We learned about the rising. We never learned about families. We never learned about the impact it had on families. It must have had a huge effect. You know, and I do believe it did. The photographs of James with his children. Yeah. He, he was a proud man. Yeah. He was very proud of his family. Yeah. And for somebody to go and take photographs with, probably had no pennies in his pocket, and to stand proudly over his family with those photographs. But 1916 means to me, and it's a purely personal point of view, it awakened in me a realisation of what it was really all about. And although my father never, our father never talked about it, 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 it just awakened things in me and then they went dormant because other things began to come into my life and uh, then in 2003 I hopped on the uh, bandwagon that was trying to save the National Monument in Moore Street and I've been involved with that since 2003. On a kind of a family note it means an epic struggle of grandfather James devoted his life to tie and find solutions to the class war between the poor and the rich. And he gave his whole life to that. Indeed, he dedicated, you might say, his death to it as well. Anybody, any small group of people can, with the will, and the intent can stand up to people and to those who will oppress them. And I think that lesson still stands today, a lesson to be learnt, that not to lie down and to be downtrodden and to be exploited and despoiled by others or to stand up and confront them and do battle with them. The life of the flesh was over for him. The spirit life had begun. And I like to think of him, radiant and smiling, still fighting and hoping, ours to follow, taking our places on the vast battlefront against empire, storming as he would of us, every enemy citadel, whether political, social, educational, economic or military, storming on, having no halting point in our campaign till the Republic of the Workers is a living reality. Constance Markovich, The Nation, March 26th, 1927. The great are not great. The great only appear great because we are on our knees. Let us arise! For the foreign squad Bowed and broke and we're on the road right. He said give me your best As he volleyed the fire Since that day many years have gone And James Conley's dream it still lives on The scars remain but the wounds have gone And tomorrow's the way survival You know there ain't no fight for freedom Yeah the days are all long gone it's a quality and change Better place for everyone Come on and join your flights of a reason 
Come together with now this one will be a nation of free people Oh, a nation for one and all 